I live in Louisville, and in our small backyard, we used to have a um, lush green carpet of St. Augustine grass. This is a breed of grass I knew nothing about coming from Ohio. Um, it is a special southern grass. It is somewhat prickly, but it's somewhat hardy. And when it grows, it grows, right? And it grew so thick. Uh, it was so established. No weeds could take root. I had an awesome backyard of green grass that my kids could play on. And uh, last summer, a drought hit our, our area, didn't it? Eight weeks, nine weeks, no rain, which is a long time when it's 105. If it were 70, that'd be different. But at 105, the ground dries up. The lakes start to dry up. We get put on a ration. Well, at the same time, my irrigation system um, that was there before me uh, broke. Unfortunate, huh? So I'm trying to manually water the grass. I'm not as consistent with it as I, as I should be. And the grass dies. The grass died on me. It didn't come back. I couldn't save it. I tried. I tried to save it. Couldn't come back. So come fall, I wanted to get it all resodded. It was just, it was toast. It's not happening. I told, my, I told Kendall and my wife, hey, I need to get, we need to get new sod back here. And, you know, we get the quote back and it's like, hey, can you also fix the fence? And hey, there's this tree that's dying. Can you take that out? Several thousand dollars, right? I mean, it just adds up really quick. And it's hard work. And she goes, ah, uh, I think you better wait. I think, think we shouldn't do that right now. I think we better wait. Let's see. Let's see what happens. So then this winter, everything froze, didn't it? At one point, we had a big freeze for about a week. Come February, my backyard is basically a few dirt patches and some dandelions. I mean, we're talking, we're talking, it's not a yard. We're talking, it's like the sand lot back there. Okay, my kids are, you know, coming in. Oh, I got dust in my eyes, roly polies. Got bunnies are like no longer visiting us. I got nothing to eat. Okay, yard is done. Um, I was like, come on. She said, nope, let's wait, let's see. Let's see what comes back, let's wait. Well, I waited. I waited. I complained. I wanted to just fix it. I wanted to do something about it. I didn't like the, to admit the fact that I had a limited budget on this situation. It's funny how like grass will bring out all these kinds of things. And you're like, what is going on? Why am I so emotional about the grass? It's like my kids are playing on it. Well, I waited. And this is what my backyard currently looks like. We got a picture of it. That's not St. Augustine. We didn't put new sod in. What grew back was trusty Bermuda. <laughs> it grew back. Bermuda grass grew back. And there, what had been patches had survived all of it. Whereas the St. Augustine had died out, the, the Bermuda had been very drought tolerant, very resistant, and it came back in patches. This is not what it looked like months ago. There were like these little springs of hope. And it started to spread. Well, now there's runners. This thing is self-propagating, right? So it like, or not propagating, but it's spreading. It puts out these runners and it takes root. And it will spread throughout the rest. This is just one section of my yard. The other half does not look this good. But I mowed it. I took the picture. It's like Instagram. I just took the picture that was, of the part that was good. I'm not going to show you the bad. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to show you when I like microwave Lunchables for my, or yeah, I guess you don't microwave those for my kids. I'm only going to take pictures of the, the good food. That's what I did. I showed you the good part of the grass. But I, I was mowing this on Saturday, and I'm like, oh, man, this is great. This is like coming in, the rain came, like he healthy spring growth. And, and it, it reminded me of what we're going to talk about today. It really, there was, there was some parallel for me. Um, today in John 3, Jesus talks to Nicodemus about spiritual life and this need to be born again from the Spirit of God in order to see the kingdom of heaven. He tells Nicodemus that we have to look to Christ to be saved. Hebrews 12 tells us to fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And he makes reference to the story of Israel in the wilderness who are bit by snakes and they have to look to the image of the snake, God's provision to be saved. And the question is, what do we do and what does God do when something doesn't go our way, when something bad happens, when there's loss, when there's delay, um, something way more significant than your St. Augustine grass dying? And we have to wait when the cares and the occupations of our lives, they pull us away from gazing at Christ and away from God to look at the things around us, do we grumble? Do we complain? Do we immediately resort to figuring it out and trying with our own ingenuity to solve the problem, to alleviate the pressure of the issue? What if the disappointments of drought of loss, 
of waiting are not actually just a loss? What if, uh, what if God is actually giving us something in those moments? What if God in Christ has given us something to gain in these times of waiting? Today we will see that God loves us so much that he calls us to look to him even in times of waiting in order to receive life. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it. John chapter 3 uh, is where we're at. Go ahead and pull out your phone. Your, if you carry an iPad, uh, I'll pray for you. But um, go ahead and open your device. Uh, biblical text of John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going to walk right through it. And so in John 3, as you, as you get there, um, the narrative continues from where we've been talking about uh, this new uh, era that Jesus is bringing in, that he, there's been these signs of the new era where he's transformed the water into wine, he's cleansed the temple, he's bringing a new way of, of cleansing, a new way of relating to God. And it continues with a specific teaching from Jesus about the nature of the spiritual life. And the first thing we'll see today is that eternal life, entrance into the kingdom of God, seeing the kingdom of God, must be given spiritually. We must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. The goal here is spiritual life. It's spiritual vision of God. It's entrance into the kingdom of God. It's eternal life. And the only kind of creature which can see God, enter God's presence, live live life with God in spiritual uh, existence, is also a spiritually alive creature. It can't be just a natural creature. Animals are physical. The trees are physical. None of these things have spiritual life in the way that you and I do as image bearers of God. Humans are spiritual and physical, but we're born in sin and we're spiritually dead. We need to be given new spiritual life. So it says Nicodemus comes in the night. He's a teacher. He's a, he's a leader of the Jews and he comes in the night. So it's a symbol that saying at night is this symbol that there's spiritual ignorance in this passage. And you'll see throughout John's gospel, light and dark, light being knowledge, um, a revelation, uh, a truth, um, holiness, and darkness is the opposite. And so we see Nicodemus coming here at night, literally during the night, and he acknowledges Jesus' authority based on the signs that Jesus has done. Um, In the narrative up to this point, those signs are literally only the transformation of the wine and the cleansing of the temple. So like that's what these signs, he says, we have to have those in mind. Nicodemus says these signs were meant, um, excuse me, he says that these signs have shown that Jesus is who he says he is. but then he, he doesn't really ask a question, and Jesus immediately starts to address him. Jesus has, hears this comment and then launches into his teaching. He says in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus is confused. Born again. So imagine you're not an evangelical in 20, or you know, Christian in 2023, where you've heard born again a lot. What do you mean born again? He's confused. Um, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into the womb and be born when he's old again? He's being sarcastic. He's, he's meant to be funny and like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? This is nonsense. It's supposed to be uh, funny, but Jesus doesn't really think it's funny because he keeps teaching. Jesus reiterates and makes it a little more clear. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So here Jesus does two things. He makes it more clear that what he's talking about is not a natural womb birth. Um, It's not again and natural, but it's actually of spirit. Um, The wordplay here is that the word anathen in Greek means from above or again. It can mean both. So Nicodemus heard again, and and Jesus is saying actually from above. It's this wordplay. Second, not only reiterating that it's not a natural birth, the second thing he does is he repeats the result of the rebirth. What's the result? In the first one, he says he cannot see the kingdom of God. In this one, it's a different metaphor. He went from saying we should see the kingdom of God to saying that we would enter the kingdom of God. There are two different things here, but they're in parallel and they explain one another. So here, seeing the kingdom and entering the kingdom are the same thing. Um, Sight is entrance. He reiterates this with Nicodemus by saying in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So don't be surprised when I say that you must be born again or born from above. 
Don't, be mar- don't marvel at that. Don't be surprised at that or shocked at that because what I'm talking to you about is spiritual. And we know this, don't we? The flesh gives birth to flesh, right? Physical descent through physical parents means that you have an inheritance. So you have an ethnicity, you have a nationality, you have a certain kind of a color of hair, you have personality traits, you have, uh, there's, and there's actually things that aren't encoded in DNA necessarily, but are uh, uh, cultural inheritances, you know, recipes, well, mannerisms of, 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 uh, with your hands when you talk and the way that you talk, uh, your accent, all these things are things that we inherit physically and are natural to us as humans. And although these things are good and they're gifts from God, they are not, they do not constitute spiritual life required for entrance into an eternal spiritual dwelling. This is where Jesus gets in uh, fights, I wouldn't say fights, but he gets in conflict in a robust dialogue with his uh, um, interlocutors, the, the Pharisees, is they say, we're children of Abraham, we're in the kingdom. And he says, don't you know that God can make children of Abraham out of the rocks if he wants to? It's not about your physical descent. It's about what's going on. Has your heart been circumcised, not your body? Have you been reborn inside? A new birth and a new life has to take place within any human being who would come to take residence in the kingdom of God. If you're going to have eternal life, there's got to be spiritual life. And so this is not an inherited thing. This is not something that you're born into. This is a gift. It's a gift from God. This is why Jesus then says, the wind blows where it wishes. Here again, there's more wordplay. Wind and spirit are the same word here in Greek and in in, uh, Hebrew, if you read in the Old Testament where God breathed the breath of life. He, he winded the wind into, into Adam and he became a living soul. Um, it's, it's this like movement air imagery, right? So the spirit, which they conceived of as like this airy substance within our mortal bodies, blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. You can't control it, right? You can't bottle the wind. I think there's a song about that. So is it with everyone who is born of the spirit. You can't control it. You can't manipulate it. You can't cause it. It happens to you. God does it by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has made clear to us that to inherit the kingdom, to have eternal life with God, a person must have a new beginning. We have to have a new spiritual birth within our souls that is wrought by the Spirit. Now, why does Jesus use this this metaphor of vision? see the kingdom of God. And he references later uh, uh, looking upon Jesus lifted up to be saved. Why does he use this metaphor of vision? Um, I have a two-month-old baby, um, and she just now is beginning to, uh, within the last couple of weeks, she's been able to actually start to focus on objects in her field of vision. When babies are first born, born, they've got a little bit of peripheral vision, and then they can see light, obviously, but there's not much else they can see. Um, colors are not there. There's not an ability to focus. Over the first two to three months, the ability to focus and actually see something in their field of vision and lock eyes happens. And that's why that's when they start looking at you and smiling. Um, over time after that, they then begin to able track stuff and, and their, their depth of vision grows and their color and all that. It matures, right? Um, same thing with us. We're born without vision and and, but and it's different. Ours doesn't, doesn't just naturally develop. God has to actually give us vision. We go from being blind, not seeing anything, to being able to see him. And then over time, we have to, uh, after, at, sorry, after we um, are given vision by God, we have a lifetime of then continually growing in that vision of God. So it's not like when you're uh, born again that you have perfect vision of God. We're called to constantly gaze at him. We're called to, to see him and to look at him as we go throughout our daily life. The more we see him, the more we are transformed. So there's the initial gaze of focus of, ah, there he is, and rebirth. But then there's the constant ongoing gaze of the Christian life that transform us. We behold, we become what we behold. We become what we behold. We are formed by what we give our attention to. What you look at will change you, literally. A.W. Tozer said, faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. Faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. So if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom. You literally can't discern. You can't perceive spiritual realities. You can't perceive the kingdom of heaven. 
He uses this uh, metaphor in the Beatitudes too when he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Literally, physically, one day we'll see Jesus when he returns. But even now, we'll see him in our spirits. When you put these together, you see how this conversation with Nicodemus is meant by John to be kind of a commentary on the, the transformation of the water into wine. The new purification of the inner person by the blood of Jesus Christ and the transformative power of Christ creates a pure heart in the child of God, which then enables us to see God. We see him now in the person of Jesus Christ as the scriptures bear witness to him, and then we will see him in person face to face in the kingdom. We cannot see God by physical means. You can't perceive spiritual realities by physical uh, ingenuity, by human ingenuity and intelligence. You might think you're the, I mean, there are people in this world who are smarter than any of us in here who cannot discern spiritual realities about God, who deny him. And there are people with very little cognitive ability who express faith in very profound ways because faith is a gaze of the soul. It's not intellectual capacity. So here's the problem. If faith is not a once-done act, A.W. Tozer says this, it's not a once-done act, but it's the continuous gaze of the heart at the triune God. Why do we take our eyes off of God? Because you and I do that. You and I take our gaze off of Jesus, don't we? We take our gaze off of him. And when we take our gaze off of Christ, we're tempted to, I think we're tempted to ask, what should I do to fix my gaze? Which is not a bad question to ask. The things that we should do to eliminate distractions, to, to run away from temptation, etc. But I want to ask this question. What does God do? What does God do when we take our gaze off of him? Does he just sit back, doesn't do anything? He says, it's up to you, your loss. What does God do when we take our gaze off of him? Jesus references this peculiar story in the Old Testament to demonstrate how looking to Christ lifted up on the cross brings salvation. So he references this story of Israel looking to the serpent, the statue of the serpent, to be healed from serpent bites that were given in judgment in Numbers 21, which we read this morning. He says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So the answer, to answer the question of what God does when we look away from Jesus, even after we've been given spiritual life, when we look away from Jesus, I want to look at this story in Numbers 21. So the first thing that we just learned is that we must re be reborn by the Spirit in order to enter or see the kingdom of God. The second thing that we're going to learn is that spiritual vision gives us the ability to see God even in the waiting. Spiritual vision given by God gives us the ability to see what God is doing even in the waiting. So in Numbers 21, the Israelites are taking this long walk. <laughs> if you could put that map up for me. So the Israelites are taking this long way around Edom, I'll, I'll point to this in a second, to avoid confrontation because they just got their butts whooped and they are in the wilderness over here and uh, they are too scared to enter the promised land on the south side. So look, they came out of Egypt, if you can see, through the Red Sea and they go down to Sinai, which we think is in the southern part of this um, peninsula. And then they travel up and if you, you can kind of see it, I know it's not as big, I wish I could have made it bigger, but you see this red line and they travel up to the southern side of Israel, of what is now Israel. You see this big loop? They travel up, and they come to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And Moses sends scouts, spies, into the land to say, okay, check it out, tell us what's in there. And most of the spies, except two, get really scared because they see really, really big people who they think they will not be able to defeat in battle, even though God has said, I will defend you and you will win. And they run away. And God gets furious. And God does not want to uh, continue on with them. Moses intercedes. He continues on. So they circle around. They come all the way back down. And then you see this kind of loop. That's because there's that sliver of land right there in between these two bodies of water. There's a, there's a nation there called Edom. And there's people that don't like them. And that will fight them. And they get in some fights. They lose some battles. They have to run away. And so they have to take, instead of just, hey, they could be in the promised land by now. You know, 
That's a long walk. (laughs) They could be in the promised land already. The thing that you've promised God, we could already be in there if you just like made it easier. If you wouldn't have sent us back out. But they've got to walk all the way around. And so in Numbers 21, we read that they are walking around Edom to go in, to go above the Dead Sea up here to go into the promised land. And we know that God says it's going to be for about 40 years because the generation that didn't have faith to go into the promised land, they're going to die off in the wilderness before they go in. So they're walking around Edom and they get pretty tired, sick and tired of walking in the wilderness. Why did you bring us out here to die? This bread that you gave us as an answer to our prayers that you're miraculously raining from heaven every day, we hate it. They got so fed up, they hated God's provision in answer to their own prayers. Now, the only thing that I can guess is that they got their eyes off God. He agreed to go with them, right? He was going to stay at Sinai, but he agreed to go with them. And his presence went with them in the wilderness. And their total and focus and love and joy ought to have been on God who was with them. My only guess is they got preoccupied with the prospect of being in the promised land. And they forgot that the only reason that the promised land was going to be any good at all was because of the presence of the one who promised it to them. You ever get your eyes off Jesus because of things around you? Get your focus? The goal is so all encapturing, all enrapturing in your mind that God's just kind of in the backseat along for a ride. It's no longer about him. If our greatest purpose can only be realized through the gaze of faith, through fixing our eyes on Jesus, then what does God do when we do this, when we do what Israel's doing? Because they have to wait and they start to grumble and then they're afflicted with snake bites and then God provides. What do we do? What does God do when we ignore the one who has done and is doing it all for us in order to look at the things themselves? And here's what I think he does. He makes us stop. Have you ever heard of Sabbath? It's built in rest. The point is, you are prone to forget. I am prone to forget. So built into our lives is the stopping. Sabbath means to cease. So that we can fix our gaze back on God. When we don't stop and we just keep barreling forward for the next destination, the next project, the next task, the next goal in life, the next, the next, the next, and we take our eyes off God, I think God oftentimes makes us stop. And sometimes he even afflicts us. Why would God make us wait either by delaying the destination or simply changing the destination completely? Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever had something coming that you thought was going to go through and then it didn't and you had to wait? You ever had an unexpected change of course? Because we're spiritual children of our Heavenly Father and we belong to a new spiritual family and a kingdom ruled and directed by the Heavenly Son of God, we live spiritual lives, not just natural lives. And our lives have all the turns and all the disappointments and all the delays and the traumatic losses of every other life. But we do not live through those things as the world does, as Christians. When those things happen to us, here's what God is offering, not to live through those things in the same way. We see them not according to the flesh, but having been been given the Spirit of God, we now can see them according to the Spirit. The Spirit moves and speaks, and we do not know where it's coming from or where it's going, but we hear it. So it is with us. So what is God up to? What is God up to when he's making you wait? Like David, you keep asking the question, get there, I'm getting there. It is not until we perceive what God is doing that we can answer what we ought to do. That's the difference between being at peace with God and yourself throughout an entire life of unexpected turns, being constantly angry, bitter, ungrateful, disappointed. The difference between that and being at peace is actually discerning God's action and God's activity even in the disappointments. 
Yes, you'll go through moments, and that's grief. Grief is not bad. You lost what was, you're going to lose what is. But then do you move to trust? Do I move to trust? And do I open my hands when that loss, when that waiting comes? You can grieve. You can have faith and discern God's ways while grieving. You cannot do it while grumbling. And that's the difference between what Israel did here and what God would have had them do. They should have repented of their, their lack of faith at Kadesh Barnea, and they could have grieved that while being faithful to God in the wilderness, but they grumbled. And you and I do the same exact thing. We grumble. We become unthankful. If you try to figure it out yourself, if you try to pay the company to come in and to put the sod in the backyard while grumbling, complaining about the weather, complaining about the lack of rain, complaining that it costs a lot of money, you will remain lost, bewildered, disillusioned, bitter. That will follow us. Have you ever seen that in your own life and in others' lives? Just strong-arming our way through every sort of situation rather than being able to say, okay, God, what? What is happening here? What are you doing? If you journey with God in faith, not only will you see the way forward and what he has planned, but you will see what he has for you right now. It's not just that you have to figure out the future. It's what is he doing in the waiting? Here's what I'm learning. Uh, against my will and contrary to what I had desired. When God brings a time of waiting, he is not taking something away from me. He is giving something to me. He is giving me the space to see him in the waiting. He is giving us the time to know him in a way that we never would have otherwise if he had just sent us on to the next thing. More than giving me space, he has something specific that he wants to do first as well. So instead of grumbling about what God has done, what if we had the eyes to see God at work in the moment of waiting as individuals and as a body? Do I believe that God loves me? Are we not a people of waiting? Have we not been waiting for Jesus for 2,000 years? Did the, the, the apostles expect that one? Did Israel expect a baby born of a virgin? Could anyone have predicted what God was going to do? No. So why try? Why try to control it? Why not just wait? Why not trust the one who loves us and gave his son for us? What if God takes me the long way around so that I can become the kind of man who patiently watches the grass grow rather than trying to fix it? Why don't we marvel at his provision rather than try to quickly go through the situation and miss that what he has to offer? We're told in Hebrews to run the race with endurance, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The Christian's heart must be directed by faith toward Christ. Our eyes must be fixed on him. Our eyes get pulled down and they get pulled away by various worries. And Jesus talked about these in the parable of the soil, didn't he? A spiritual life must be lived with spiritual eyes so that when God takes us on a journey we didn't expect, we can ask what he's doing and what we ought to be doing as well. To the glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.